My name is Forrest Rosenbach. Uh, I made a pretty poor choice when I was 18 years old and in the army, and I, uh, I was arrested for smoking marijuana. And when I was uh, discharged from the military, I tried to enroll at Hesser College in Manchester, New Hampshire. And they, I filled out the whole financial aid form, turned it into the enrollment counselor, and she denied me immediately. She said that the federal financial, law, fa financial aid laws do not allow them to give out loans to drug charges. I think it's ridiculous and that's why I'm here today to support HB 1623. So, you, But you've managed to uh, surmount your youthful indiscretion and you're now a pillar in the community and... Absolutely, I'm going to the University of Phoenix for business and I'm also currently an applicant to become a Border Patrol agent. Uh, Matt Simon of NH Common Sense, you want to give us a little intro? What's going on today? It's beautiful. The sun's out. We also have a hearing uh, coming up in the Senate Judiciary Committee on HB 1623, and uh, we're excited about that as well. Seriously. Representative Ellen Nielsen and I represent Sullivan Poor, uh, Claremont, Flemster, and Unity. And I was asked to um, present an amendment to 1623, which has been prepared by Representative Spontus. And it is basically uh, the same bill with two changes. Um, in line six, they have added the clause the phrase, for a first offense. In the case of marijuana, in a quantity of less than 0.25 ounces, including any adulterants or dilutants, for a first offense, the person shall be guilty of a violation, etc. And then they have made a, another change. They have said, uh, beginning in line eight and continuing through line 10, that the provisions of RSA 651.53a shall apply to a person convicted under this subparagraph, except that such person may file a petition for annulment no earlier than six months after completion of all the terms and conditions of the sentence. And those are the changes that their new amendment makes. Uh, no, this is not my bill. I'm, okay. I'm simply standing in. Okay, thank you. Okay. I was going to say at the outset, we have a lot of people who are signed up to speak. Uh, and uh, if you hear something that you're planning to say, don't feel that you have to say it again. Uh, it's late in the day. We do hear pretty well. So uh, make your point. Just confirm that you uh, that you agree or disagree, and uh, give us something new. Uh, uh, Karen Echol. Thank you. I'm lucky. I get to go first. I can say everything I want to say. Uh, my name is Karen Echol. I'm here on behalf of the Attorney General's office. And the Attorney General uh, does not support this bill. The current law, as written, is not a problem. The problem is uh, drug abuse and drug use. This uh, 
House Bill 1623 not only would reduce the penalty for a misdemeanor to a violation, but it also reduces the fine, um, which currently is a mandatory $350 under the drug code. Any way you want to look at this bill, it sends um, a very clear message. It sends a, a, a pro-drug message. The message is, we don't think that marijuana is so bad. We don't think that it's dangerous, and we don't think it's a big deal. So go ahead and try it. If you want to use it, you can do that, because there won't really be any consequence for that. And if you want to carry around your personal stash of up to a quarter of an ounce, you can do that too, because there really isn't any real penalty or consequence for that either. That is a, a very dangerous message to be sending out at this time, when we know that the drug problem in New Hampshire is on the rise, and marijuana is already the number one drug of choice. So how do you answer the, the information that they've been presenting us that uh, one conviction keeps them from getting college loans that you go forward and that they don't have a, and this is what we're being told, and that they don't have an opportunity to change and go forward? Well, there are different, uh, let me take one, one thing at a time there. The, furthermore, first of all, the, um, the idea that the, uh, a drug conviction um, by changing the penalties of our statute, it's going to ensure that a, an individual who um, is convicted of a drug crime um, is going to be, um, you know, is not going to be denied federal aid. That, that's, that's actually not true. Um, the way federal student aid works is uh, there is a form that you fill out, and one of the questions is, have you been convicted of an, an offense an offense that involves the possession of illegal drugs or selling illegal drugs under state or federal law. Now, we can reduce our state penalty. That doesn't change the fact that it's still an offense. A violation or a misdemeanor, it's still an offense. The answer to that question on line 31 on the federal student aid form is going to be yes. Now, they, it goes on, though, to ask, did you receive this conviction while you were receiving aid? Well, that does make a difference. That will. Um, that will result in, in a suspension of um, your aid for a short period of time. There is no amount of tinkering or tweaking of our current law that's going to change that fact. If a person has a drug conviction while they're receiving federal aid, they are, they are likely to lose that aid. Um, another problem with this uh, idea that, that changing our law will, will insulate them is that we're assuming that everyone who's in college receiving aid is in New Hampshire. Well, I would say that that's probably not true. So it's not going to protect New Hampshire citizens who are in college in Maine or New Hampshire or in Maine or Massachusetts or any other state. They'll be subject to those laws in those states. So the conviction, you know, as well shrouded as this is in good intentions, it doesn't accomplish what the proponents of the bill are saying it will accomplish. And that's, that's important. Um, to, to understand. And I don't know if the state, uh, the sponsors have looked into this, but they're, to the extent that they have identified a problem, um, some states do deny their um, state-based um, aid to students in their state if they, um, based on the eligibility factor on the, the federal aid form. So. We should sort of we should look to see if we are denying our own our own state um, our own students in our state the federal aid that they could be in, or the state aid that they could be entitled to. Uh, we may not be uh, we may be denying them, and that may not be what we want to be doing. The state could, um, for instance, uh, mandate that the state agencies the financial aid be made available to applicants, um, irrespective of drug convictions or they could adopt a different form. The legislature could also adopt a resolution to uh, calling on the, con on the US Congress to repeal the higher education provision, drug provision. But changing our law is not the answer. 
Education and enforcement remain the most important tools that we have in the state to combat drugs, drug abuse, and the crimes associated with it. The citizens of our state deserve our best efforts, and so the <coughs> Attorney General would urge you to vote down this bill. Thank you. Taking a question. Under current federal law, and New Hampshire changes its statute, does this affect any of our, uh, our laws and report to the feds? And how does that affect us? And what money do we need to receive for, the, for, uh, for enforcing drug laws? Has anybody looked at that over the Attorney General's office? Your question is what impact would it have to pass a law? If we, change our, if we change our, our, mm -hmm. our, our laws, say we change the law the way this bill is written, does that affect any grant money that we may be getting to combat uh, drug abuse in the state from the federal government? I don't Have know. Have looked at that? I, I don't know the answer to that, and I, I think that it certainly would uh, put us in a vulnerable position. Potentially, we, you know, there are only, I think, 12 or 13 states that have passed similar legislation, that's not the majority. So obviously any state that's passing uh, laws that are contra uh, to the federal law, you are getting their attention on some level. Well, just to follow up. I, I heard you say you didn't know, so you'd be guessing if the answer. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Okay, want to follow up? Yeah. yeah, just to follow up. We had just to have like a street sweeper uh, grant money and that's supposed to clean up the, uh, the drugs down in Manchester and, and, the, and the drug activity that's going on down here. And that's a federal grant. I and mean, I'm just wondering how this affects all of that. If you can look into it, and get back to us. I appreciate that. I will, thank you. Thank you. See, just a question. Do you know what other crimes would, would um, bump you off the, the federal aid other than marijuana? It's if I rob a bank, are they going to kick me off? <coughs> So marijuana is the only thing that they use to take me? It is the it is the one question that they ask in terms of. Uh, okay, so it's only marijuana. No, no, so it's all control drugs. All control drugs. Okay, so all control drugs. But what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correct, it's really something that needs to be taken care of by Congress. Congress is the only one that can change that form. Is that correct? Simply. Yes. It, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Burrage, are you here? Yes, I am. I apologize, I didn't see the rest on here. Uh, Representative uh, Vargas, are you here? Okay, and uh, is there another representative here? Uh, Thank you for uh, listening to my testimony so late today. My name is Delmar Burrage. I'm a representative, member of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. In fact, I sat on that subcommittee, and I was the only one who voted against uh, any marijuana bills. Before I started my job here in the House, I worked 35 years in juvenile court in the city of Philadelphia. Starting out as a juvenile probation officer, late 60s and 70s, working on the street, you know, among the gang wars, the drugs, everything. And when I left, and before I came up here and retired and reinvented myself, I was running a courtroom. 17 courtrooms responsible for about 168,000 petitions a year, 17 judges working for me, et cetera, et cetera. But when I worked on the street in the late 60s and 70s, uh, some of my probations were required to see me twice a week for an hour for group counseling in groups of eight or nine or 10. It was an approach called correctional group counseling. Every once in a while, a character would walk in and they would say, Delmar, he's high. You know, see his eyes, his facial gestures. Okay, roll the cameras we would often videotape our cameras. Without any doubt, every time that camera was played back when that probationer came back and saw us, and he saw himself on TV, he was ashamed. He, trust me, take this to the bank. He never said anything intelligent that was coherent. Meanwhile, under the stupor, or under the influence of the drug, he thought he was doing pretty well. It's like trying to talk to a drunk. The marijuana today is different from the 60s. Remember, I was taking 1968, flower power, the t-shirts, the tie-dye, Lucy in the sky with diamonds, 
uh, you know, make love, not war. Very nice. This is 30 years later. Think of that number, eight. It's not 68, it's now 2008. 30 years later. The THC level is now 38.9% higher. This is the active ingredient that gets you high. You can't over overdose on marijuana. You don't get uh, physiologically addicted to marijuana like heroin, cocaine, and crack, and all the other things. Uh, it's not going to happen. What you do, you have these receptors in the brain. After they get their amount, boom, you pretty much max out. So it takes a lot less weed to get high. You know, we have uh, reblooming hydrangeas and all these other things in the cultural world. So they have improved marijuana. Where are we today? So it takes less to get high. Logically, you see the connection. So it's now a psychological addiction. So needless to say, you have a cause and effect that's occurring much, much more quickly. I see in the room behind me, many people I know, some are on my uh, criminal justice advisory board. I teach, uh, I run a criminal justice program in one of the community colleges. Some I te uh, teach for me, I order the textbooks, and they deal with this issue. They're on the opposite side. I have no ill will or harm against uh, these folks who speak here with their own philosophy and intent and in goodwill. Um, but I know this. Um, we have a jail in Cheshire County. And on one wall, one of the drug counselors has her death wall. And she puts on all the previous persons spending time in jail who did drugs who are now dead. And the thing she has on there is they all started out with marijuana. Well, I'm not going to say this is a gateway drug that lead to this and lead to that. These people, I'm not worried about. I'm not, they have life skills. They'll do fine. I'm here, I'm talking about the seventh graders and the eighth and ninth graders. These folks are very coherent. They'll come and they'll speak very well. Um, my brother spoke very well. He just finished college, 1973, a triple major. Let's see, philosophy, psychology. Representative, we just focus on today's work. Sure. Just bring it down to sure. the bill. Sure, gotcha. We've got 20 people who want to testify at least. I will honor your wishes. You're sending the wrong message to the youngsters. Uh, I'm worried about the seventh graders who walk past the drug-free zone, past the dare car, past the high school resource officer, and can't go to the bathroom of Monadnock Regional High School. You go in there, just getting harassed by the drug dealers. Down the street, Concord. Yo, need a baggie? It's not an ounce, not a quarter an ounce. It's not a flask, it's not a joint. You need a bag? Right down the street, Concord, Brady. The bill is flawed. Any one of these folks in good will and good-hearted nature will share a joint. Because now they have their certain amount that they're allowed to have. They're now a dealer. Once you share that joint, that's a law. In another jurisdiction, I would say, officer, arrest him. I would kill the bill and not put our youngsters behind the eight ball. They have enough at risk every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is John E. Call, Jr. I represent Coas District 2, uh, southernmost district of Coas County. I'm also a uh, part-time police chief in the town of Dalton. I've been in law enforcement for approximately 35 or 36 years in this county. I was the chair of the subcommittee that, that heard this bill. And um, I have very grave concerns about the bill as it, as it passed the House. You heard talk from the AG's office about the, the federal requirements. It's the U.S. Code, Title 20. I think it's Section 49. I, I can't go into the whole thing. That basically deals with uh, denial of student aid for those people who are caught and convicted while receiving the aid or grants or that type of funds. Under that title, which is uh, amended in 2006, first offense, you lose your student aid for one year. However, if you complete a rehab program, you can get it back sooner than that. Uh, for uh, second offense, it gets longer, and for third offense, it's indefinite. Uh, for sale, it's, I believe it's two years, and for second offense, uh, for sale, it's indefinite. The problem with this bill is, is that it, it equates the possession of a small quantity of marijuana with a, with a traffic ticket. 
The only problem with that is a traffic ticket, if you get 12 traffic tickets, you become a habitual offender and you're facing a chance of going to state to jail for that. Under this bill, you can have 100 convictions and only pay a $200 fine each time. It also ignores the fact that it's based on this amendment you've got to get for That's correct. But that's on the amendment. I'm talking about the, the basic bill. The amendment itself uh, is better. However, the problem comes is that it allows somebody to get an annulment after six months. So you could still have a series of several convictions because you've had those convictions annulled. Uh, it also does one thing which, is, which, is, which worries me greatly, is it tends to ignore the other violations of our, our, of our drug laws. For example, possession of paraphernalia. Drug paraphernalia is a misdemeanor crime. If you have a pot pipe with your quarter ounce, you can get a violation fine for the quarter ounce, but you get a misdemeanor conviction, conviction for the possession of the pipe. It also ignores the fact that if you happen to have it in a motor vehicle, you're facing transportation of a controlled drug, which is a misdemeanor crime. And if you do as the federal representative says, start sharing your pot pipe or your marijuana with your friends, technically that is a felony conviction for sale, which you're looking at. Um, I just think that this bill is, is sending the wrong message to the, to the, uh, the people. It, it tends to give you a, a, an idea, even for a, a first offense, uh, that it's not a big deal, that you should go ahead and no big deal. You think, if you go to, if you take it to school, you're facing a, a violation under the Drug Free School Act. There's a whole lot of bad things that can happen to you under the misinterpretation of the fact that it's not a big deal. Any questions? Mayor Clay? John, you mentioned the pipes, and I think that's saying it all. So my understanding is, from looking at the law, rolling papers are also illegal. Really that's correct. So uh, my understanding is today, quarter ounce can get eight joints, so that's eight violations of rolling papers, so that quarter ounce would automatically have a hundred dollar hit on every use of the paper, so it's an eight hundred dollar fine plus a misdemeanor for every, so if they have a quarter ounce, how do they get to use it? They can't smoke in the pipe, they can't roll it, so how do they use it? That's a, an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, so I, I believe you're correct though. So the bill as it is, gives a false sense of security to anybody who thinks that they can have a quarter ounce because they're liable to have something else in their pocket, as you mentioned, that's going to be just as bad if not worse. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for taking the question of the thought. Uh, you heard the question I asked earlier. Did any discussion come up in the committee, the subcommittee, on whether or not federal grant money could be lost through passage of this legislation? No. Uh, it would be my guess, and this is a, a guess on my part, that it would not affect the, the grant money as long as we continue to keep the, uh, the, the even at a violation level, it would be an offense. Uh, you'd still be arrested, you'd still be prosecuted, you'd still, be, you'd still have a, a record of the violation. So I, I would, my guess would be no, it wouldn't. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't be interpreted that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Tim Gargas. For those of you who have not been here before, it's customary to have the senators and representatives testify Thank first, you. and then we'll get right on to the rest of it. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Representative Carolyn Gargas, representing Hillsboro District 5. Today I'm here as the co-chair of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council. And <clears throat> none of the council members were able to be here, so I am sharing what they have heard at some public forums that they have conducted quite recently. They have narrowed down all the bills we were looking at this year to four that they were going to have discussed at the public forums. When this bill passed the House, they decided to add this one. So they thought the topic would uh, be of interest to young people and create a lively discussion, which it did. Two of the forums took this up. By the way, the council members were the facilitators of the forum. Their opinions on this are not going to be in any of the comments that I made. And they have not taken a stand for or against. That's why I didn't put 
But <coughs> at the Plymouth Forum, there were 15 high school students and three teachers, and also Senator Reynolds. Um, and they pretty much said, why change the law? You're not supposed to do it anyway. And it may encourage people to use if there is less of a penalty, <coughs> and the state would be softening its stand. Now, there was a forum in Newmarket, very small forum, three male students from UNH, two parents and one grandparent. And the following comments are their ideas, perceptions, not, not mine. Um, but they, question, they had a question about how many states have decriminalized marijuana. They said Maine didn't see a change in its use when it was decriminalized. They said the drug war is not working against marijuana. It's the most accessible drug. It's been around forever, and a lot of cops don't do anything about it sharing their comments. And they said some use marijuana for medical reasons, to reduce anxiety, not to get high. And they said that 12 to 13 percent of people in jail are non-violent from drug-related problems. Also, they said this bill could cut court costs and time. It costs 30000 to keep an inmate in jail which could they pay for a college student for a year. And regarding the loss of financial aid, which was one of the main <coughs> arguments for this change in this bill, they said kids are not thinking years ahead. They do stupid things as young people. They said cigarettes and alcohol kill many more people. There's never been a death attributed to marijuana. At this point, I did have to say something myself in this forum, because marijuana can suppress nausea, which combined with alcohol can lead to excessive drinking and possibly to alcohol poisoning. Those are my comments. He said, if you are a smoker, you are more likely to smoke marijuana. And people think marijuana is a gateway drug. One student didn't think that this was true. One student, after reading the blog in the union leader following the passage of this bill, said most people didn't understand the difference between decriminalization and legalization. And this bill makes it a violation rather than a misdemeanor, but it's still illegal. And the father who was there said, make the fine greater. $200 isn't enough. Make it $1,000. And um, afterward, one of the young men said, Admit it. At a thousand dollars, that fine would be a deterrent. And personally, I just let you know that I did vote against the bill in the house. And Thank you. I, I thought you'd be interested in the opinion. Thank you. Uh, Matt Simon. Sorry, it's my first time in the Senate. I'm very happy to be here. Just identify yourself for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Matt Simon. I Simon, I'm just going to ask you, do you have a prepared statement in front of you? It's, it's, it's it, notes for me to speak from. Is it more than one page long that you intend to read? It's about one and one half pages, right. sir. Is that okay? I kept, I timed it to about three, three and a half minutes. Is right. that all right? Great. Uh, for the record, my name is Matt Simon. I am Executive Director of the New Hampshire Coalition for Common Sense Marijuana Policy, also known as NH Common Sense. I realize it's a beautiful afternoon. I will try to be brief. The powerful handout I've given you is from the day of our vote in the House. Uh, that surprising day. I know you've already received it, but I thought it looked nice as a cover page. Turn to the back side briefly. When we began this effort back in January, I started with a simple appeal to one of those bedrock principles of, of the government that we find in the New Hampshire Constitution. Part 1, Article 18, tells us that all penalties should be, or shall be, proportioned to the nature of the offense. And one fact that I find fascinating is that throughout this process, none of our opponents has seriously argued that the current penalty for marijuana possession 
is proportion to the nature of the effects. I've yet to hear that. In New Hampshire, possession of less than one ounce of marijuana is class A misdemeanor. We know the fine, the, the penalty up to a year in jail. Our opponents assure us, rather than telling us that those penalties should be enforced the way they are, they assure us that they aren't enforced the way that they are written. They tacitly admit that incarcerating marijuana users is useless, even counterproductive. I may be painting with the broad brush, there may be some opponent that I'm not thinking of, but mostly the arguments that we hear are that these penalties are not enforced the way they are. They assure us that minor offenses are routinely reduced to violations and punished with small fines, which is exactly what we're asking for with this bill. And they do not suggest that imposing harsher penalties than what are currently imposed would in reality be either or appropriate or effective. So if nobody agrees that the penalties on our books are appropriate, then why isn't it wise to change them? Well, I obviously think we should. Our policies were constitutionally questionable at their inception, but they were adopted based on the belief that harsh penalties would dramatically reduce marijuana availability and use. This was in the early 70s. People believed we got really tough on drugs that they would go away. The same thing was believed in the 80s and again in the 90s. Uh, that hasn't happened, and, and the charts that I've given you demonstrate that as arrests go up and up and up, and we're 830,000 arrests in the United States last year for marijuana, 88% of them for possession alone. I don't know what that costs exactly to government at all of these levels, but I'm sure it's, uh, you know, William F. Buckley always made the arguments that every, every time somebody, some police officer is chasing marijuana users or arresting or processing marijuana offenses, that there's somebody out there getting robbed or raped or being the victim of, a, of what I would consider to be a real serious crime. And <clears throat> get back to my, my little speech here. Um, I hope we can also get serious at some point about what it means to threaten a person with incarceration. Uh, at this point in history, it's finally become clear that we'll have to address our outlook on incarceration as a form of punishment for nonviolent offenses. When President Nixon declared war on drugs, war on marijuana in particular, there were under 200,000 Americans incarcerated in our jails and prisons. Today, the number is over 2.3 million. The New York Times recently reported a study by the Pew Research Center, which found that one in 99 adult Americans is incarcerated today. This is a rate far, far higher than any other nation in the world, and I, I consider that a travesty in the country we still call the land of the free. After all these years of arrests, marijuana availability to teens, as this second chart shows, is still around 85%. It always hovers between 85 or 90%, no matter what policies the government sets. And as a former college student, former college instructor, and having spent many hours of my life talking to young people about these issues, they don't care what the law is. If they want to smoke pot, they're going to do it. The people, in my experience, who were deterred by these penalties would be deterred by other methods. I actually like Representative Burge's method one of the best methods I've heard in a long time. I think that's better, actually, than threatening people with incarceration. If we could find a way to, to film them and show the videos, that might discourage them from using marijuana, which is what our policies don't currently do, I would argue. Uh, fortunately, 11 state legislatures since 1973 have passed laws reclassifying marijuana offenses, and None of the doom and gloom scenarios have happened in many of these states. If they had, that would be part of our opposition's testimony. Look at what happened in this state when they decriminalized. These bad things happened. The same arguments happened in all these states in 1976 when Maine did this. That's the year I was born. When Maine did this, they, people said it would send the wrong message to young people. Marijuana use would increase, and it didn't happen. Today, actually, Maine's marijuana use is slightly lower than New Hampshire's, despite the fact that it's a violation and there's no threat of incarceration whatsoever. Uh, I'm told that a similar bill, actually co-sponsored by a young representative by the name of Jim Splain, passed the New Hampshire House in the 1970s, but was killed in the Senate. I dearly wish it had passed, had passed then, as I think the people in New Hampshire would have reaped many unseen benefits from a better proportion and more sensible policy. And finally, I've given you a handout that illustrates our results from a recent poll, and as you say, as you see, 53% of New Hampshire citizens this one here, does, uh, do support not just HB 1623 as written, but a, a more ambitiously written bill that would decriminalize 
less than one ounce and make it a $100 fine. We still got a majority of New Hampshire citizens saying yes to that question, which is written right there for you. Uh, majorities in every single demographic, even the older demographic, overwhelming support from Democratic voters, but interestingly, a dead even split among Republican voters on whether or not marijuana should be decriminalized in New Hampshire. So, um, see, just a couple of quick comments. The paraphernalia and transportation things, I, I agree that those are flaws in the bill. That's why I asked back in the House that those things be added to the bill to cover those. Other states with decriminalization laws in effect do, did also reduce the penalties for possession in a vehicle, did also uh, take away the penalties for paraphernalia because of course, it, I, I understand your point very well, Senator Clegg, the question, it is, it is a problem and kids do need to know the law. Regardless of how this turns out, one thing I've learned from the process is that people like me do, need to do a better job making sure that the young people across the state knows, know what the laws are and are not because it would give a false sense of security as passed, perhaps, and yet I do not think that is a reason to kill the bill. I think it could be a reason to improve it or to continue to talk about it and how we can get our New, Ham our New Hampshire marijuana laws into the 21st century. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take the question. Did you also know that, did you help write this bill? I did not. did, okay. And I want to ask that question. I'll ask you a different one. Do you believe that we should do the same thing with the alcohol laws um, that, that we're doing with the marijuana law? which is that right now, someone who's not legal to use alcohol can be arrested simply for smelling like alcohol. The fine is a minimum of $300. First offense, I think it's $600. Second offense. So should we move all of the unlawful use of alcohol into this same style and do marijuana and alcohol at the same time? Thank you for the question, Senator. Did I, I hear correctly you're talking about minors only? I'm talking about illegal use of the substance. So, oh. illegal use of alcohol is anyone under 21. Okay. Um, I have not thought about that specific problem that, that you pose, and I do not have a good answer for Greg. I'm sorry. Did you give me one? Uh, the problem I have is neither, neither drug is legal for someone 15 to use, but under, under the bill that you're a proponent of, I'm going to make it a simple violation and allow them to do it. But if they, if they're 15, if they have a bottle of beer or a glass of wine, you're going to find them $300, and if they do it a second time, I don't even have to catch them with this stuff. I don't have to smell it from a police officer. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you to get back to me whether or not the ancient common sense believes that we ought to treat the use of alcohol, which is an illegal substance if you're under 21, the same way we would treat someone who's got with marijuana, which is an illegal substance regardless of what you're using. I thank you for the question. It's an interesting concern that I will raise with my board of directors, and I'll be happy to get back to you with an answer. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be very brief. My name is Kevin O'Brien. I'm Chief of Policy and Planning for the Department of Safety. Uh, we oppose the bill. Uh, we may remain opposed to it. Uh, Two things kind of jump out at me. I was I've been a police officer for over 35 years. When I started law enforcement, the BAC level was 0.18. It's been since lowered to 0.08. Uh, when I started out in police work, it had to be 21 to consume alcohol. We lowered it to 18, and then we moved it back up to 21 because of all the problems we caused. Uh, I just think this is a slippery slope. It sends the wrong message. Uh, I've been a parent for almost 30 years. And it's not a message I would want to be giving to our children. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Richard Crate. Good afternoon. Thank you. I do have a prepared statement. I'm just going to briefly go over a couple things. For the record, my name is Richard Crate Jr. I'm the Chief of Police in the town of Enfield. I'm a law enforcement officer of 20 years. Uh, speaking on behalf of the New Hampshire Chiefs Association, who oppose, strongly oppose this bill. When the bill passed the House on March 18th, I was deeply disappointed. There's been testimony that people who smoke marijuana are less violent. I used to believe this as well, until one day during the execution of a search warrant, 
on a marijuana user and producer who had to be subdued while he was trying to grab a 357 handgun. If it wasn't for the quick actions of Detective Zalangowski in the Lebanon Police Department, there is no doubt this individual would have killed. We all know the health risk of marijuana, so I'm going to just brush over that. And I also want to include two photos that we received from a DEA agent who used to work for my department, who is now stationed uh, down in Texas. <coughs> and it shows 1,200 pounds of marijuana that was seized by the DEA coming into the United States. Contrary to the previous speaker, in 1975, the Alaska Supreme Court ruled the state, the state cannot interfere with adults' possession of marijuana for personal consumption in the home. According to a 1988 University of Alaska study, the state's 12 to 17 year olds used marijuana at more than twice the national average of their age group, demonstrating their belief that increased use was too high a price to pay, Alaska's residents voted in 1990 to recriminalize possession of marijuana. By 1992, with tougher laws and increased attention to the risk of drug abuse, that figure has been reduced to 22%, a 57% decline. Drugs are far more addictive than alcohol. According to Dr. Mitchell Rosenthal, director of the Phoenix House, only 10% of drinkers become alcoholics, while up to 75% of regular illicit drug users become addicted. Last year, this body fought to protect the citizens of our state by not allowing people to smoke in public facilities, smoke tobacco in public facilities. And now we're here discussing decriminalizing marijuana. During the subcommittee hearing, I voiced my concern that the negative message sent to our children if this legislation passed the House. The following day, the headlines read that New Hampshire is decriminalizing marijuana. I implore you to, def to defeat this bill and send a loud and clear message to our children that marijuana is dangerous and harmful. We just arrested a person who was dealing marijuana, dealing three ounces to an undercover officer. That person was from Burlington, Vermont. We contacted the Burlington, Vermont police early on in the investigation to see if they were interested in working conjunctionally with us on this case to get the person who had brought this drugs into our state. Their response was that they would help in any way they could, being a law enforcement agency. However, they're dealing with other heroin and crack cocaine issues up there, so that marijuana wasn't on their priority. New York City, many years ago, had a huge drug problem and a huge you know, criminal problem. And when they, when they, Mayor Giuliani and the commissioner at the time decided that they were going to get tough on all these minor issues. And by doing that, that brought down the crime. By sending the message that we're going to decriminalize marijuana, it's, it's taking it away. So we're going to have similar problems in of the Burlington Police Department. We're small communities, and we address these problems in a local way. And by addressing the problem that marijuana is bad, we don't have to deal as much with the bigger issues of heroin, crack cocaine, and methamphetamines that are out there. Because we're already back here saying marijuana is bad. So if we're going to arrest somebody for marijuana, look at what the consequences are going to be. In closing, the most important thing to remember is that this body has made huge progress over the years is Captain before me spoke. Drug, actually DWI went from a 0.18, that was before my time, down to a 1.0, down to an 0.8. And we're, we've seen our accidents resulting less and less because of the laws that have been enacted in this building and across the street. We need to continue on that. We need to defeat this. And again, the consequences of the decisions that are made today are going to affect the children, my grandchildren. And it's very important that we defeat this. And thank you. Uh, sorry. Thank you.
in my final closing statement is we have a motto in the state of Liquor or Die, and I know people use that all the time. We're also, I mean, prohibition is not freedom. You know, and we are going to stand up, whether it happens here or out there in this world. We are celebrating, or people are celebrating, our 75th year, year anniversary of um, prohibition, uh, or anti-prohibition of alcohol, 75 years. And really, just a few years after that, marijuana became illegal. Senator um, Clegg has a question. One, one, just one moment. Um, you just wait. Senator Clegg. I, I have a question. You, you, you just you said a few minutes ago that we, we should be looking at this as, as things that God has given us. So am I to understand that you believe that we should legalize mushrooms, heroin? No. Heroin is not given oh. to us by It's chemically altered to transform that product. Oh, so only those things that are Oh, I are completely agree. So mushrooms should be legal. Psychedelic mushrooms should be legal. Oh, well, like I mean, to answer the question that you asked the gentleman, which I thought was no, I'm asking you, should psychedelic mushrooms be legal? No, they should not. Why? It's well, the I mean, they grow. yes, they should be legal. I thought you meant legal. Thank you. Um, and heroin no, should not because they alter the the poppy flower, the chemical. What about cocaine? Oh, that should definitely be illegal, completely. Anything altered by any kind of what man genetics. What if you just import the leaves and want people to chew on them? Um, should that be okay? Oh, chew on I think, well, I mean, weed is by far has more nutrients and vitamins than no, any other uh, leaves are in. Coca leaves should be legal if they're not adult. Say what? Coca leaves should be, should be legal? No, it should no. be illegal. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, New Hampshire was the first. You have about 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay. New Hampshire was one of the last states to actually legalize marijuana. And it is going to be the last one potentially to actually reform marijuana. And that's a big thing. And to your question, which I have great respect for about the alcohol thing, we need to go after the parents. Our parents are what's failing our society in those respects. Okay, and if it's about alcohol and an underage person, it needs to be that addressed by that parent because that parent is not doing their job. Thank, Thank you. you. popular rock star, trust me, drugs work. You don't need to try them. Most drugs have pretty bad side effects, like addiction. Marijuana isn't one of them. Not only does it have little side effects, about the only thing that makes it addictive is that it is pleasurable. This chart shows Uh, data that was published in the medical journal The Lancet in March of 2007, and it's available on, on the internet. Uh, what the authors did is define three parameters, dependence, physical harm, and social harm, and break each of those down into three parameters, each of which is assigned a value from zero to three by a group of experts, zero being no risk and three being extreme risk. For dependence, the parameters are pleasure, psychological dependence, and 
physical dependence. For physical harm, the three parameters are acute harm, chronic harm, and intravenous harm. None of the three most popular drugs, alcohol, tobacco, or marijuana, have any intravenous use. The third group, social harm, is not shown, but includes intoxication, other social harm, and health care costs. If you look at the chart, you will see that of the three most commonly used drugs, one, tobacco, the yellow one, is much more addictive, and one, alcohol, shown in red, has much more physical harm than the other two. And the data is on the back of the chart. The 20 drugs on the back of the chart, in the chart, are listed in order of overall harm based on all nine parameters. Tobacco has the highest chronic harm of all 20 and the second highest health care cost. Heroin has the highest acute harm, and that means it'll kill you right away. Chronic means it'll eventually kill you. And the highest dependence in all three parameters. Cocaine has the second highest harm. Alcohol has the second highest intoxication and the third highest social harm. As you can see, there are bad drugs like heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and tobacco, but marijuana isn't one of them. We have lived for two generations in an era of prohibition of marijuana, similar to the 14 years of prohibition of alcohol, both which produced similar results, increasing lawlessness and crime, but the origin of the two are quite different. Alcohol is quite harmful, and prohibition was implemented by do-gooders who thought that they would be making the world better if they rid the world of alcohol. Prohibition had no such effect. Prohibition simply created a market for crime. The origin of marijuana prohibition, however, was quite different. It turns out that the only reason marijuana was declared a killer drug was because William Randolph Hearst of newspaper fame owned forests and not hemp fields at a time that most paper was made from hemp and he wanted to make hemp illegal so that his forests would become more valuable because they would have to be used for making paper. Making marijuana illegal has served no purpose other than making criminals out of millions of otherwise law-abiding citizens. Yes, there's a reason marijuana was made illegal, but it was only to make one person more wealthy. Only Congress can decriminalize marijuana, and that is being discussed, but we do, do not need to criminalize it. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any questions? Okay. I do have uh, copies also of the Lancet article here. Mr. Van Winkler? Yes, sir. You're up. Honorable committee, good afternoon. For the record, my name is Richard Van Winkler. I testify today as a lifelong citizen of New Hampshire and also as a member of law enforcement against prohibition. Uh, the one thing that I've heard today listening to both sides of this is that the, the drug war is failing. It's not working. That's one thing that we can all agree to. I testified in favor of House Bill 1623 and I also wrote a letter to every member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives detailing reasons but I, as a law enforcement official, support this bill. As we pursue evidence-based policies and programs as public officials, there are far more evidence to support the passage of bills such as this than there is to not support this bill. About six months ago, I would agree with the testimony of the law enforcement officials that you had here just six months ago. But then I began to read about it and to research it, and the amount of evidence that's out there is overwhelming. Factual data provided by our own government sources suggest that we review drug war laws more carefully and approach them more intelligently than we have in the past. Current drug war laws are fueled with hysteria and misinformation. 
The result is a system that costs the taxpayers enormously, it yields nothing positive, it negatively impacts lives, and continues to demand more money and more resources, which are often allocated in response to unfounded paranoia about the drug war laws. When you are told that a law enforcement officers do not arrest people for small amounts of marijuana under our current laws, I submit to you two points. First, that statement does not match national data. Marijuana arrests are at an all-time high, and each year it gets higher in this country, with all jurisdictions claiming that they do not always arrest when they're required to by law. Secondly, supporting such logic means that we condone unchecked discretion among law enforcement officers who may let one individual slide and arrest another in the same situation, which results in differential treatment. This to me is an ugly characteristic of law enforcement that is very real in our country, and it's an opportunity for abuse. I've had the opportunity to speak with several legislators and some senators on this issue since this measure passed the House. Everyone indicated to me after a brief conversation that they believe that the war on drugs and associated laws have failed and that they will continue to fail and that something different needs to occur. Before the vote on House Bill 1623 by the House, some elected officials indicated that they feared support of such a bill because the public demands a tough on crime policy. I have never met anyone who did not want to be tough on crime. The issue is that drug use, abuse, or addiction are not crimes. They're behaviors with exaggerated consequences that result in an explosion of prison building and lack of jail beds while we cut funding for rehabilitation and treatment at all levels for the public. The United States Drug War and Associated Hysteria has cost too much money. It's destroyed too many lives and provides enormous profit and power to organize crime, and it will continue to do that with our support. Lastly, with respect to this bill, the legislature has spoken the will of the people through the systemic process that our country has in place for such public order. My plea with you today, and our honorable governor, is to not simply reject the significant work that our legislators have performed in passing this bill. I ask the Senate and the governor to please put some work into understanding this bill the way that the House did. I ask that you consider the facts and honor the evidence as you cast your vote with the power that the people entrusted you with. This is most respectfully submitted. I appreciate your time today and your patience this afternoon. Thank you. I have a question then. Since you're in favor of the bill, do you have a problem with making the use of alcohol at the same age to, to have the same uh, punishment as the use of marijuana? Well, sir, I think your question is pertinent if we were to be discussing the legalization of these drugs, and we're no, not. I don't want to talk about legalization. But, but, but I want to talk about, no, let me finish, because I get the control here. Yes, sir. I want to say that both are illegal to do. Yes. One happens to be legal when you hit 21. So right. let's talk about the illegal use of alcohol and the illegal use of marijuana. Correct. Why should the penalty be any different for marijuana than it is for alcohol? Or should it? For a minor. Anybody who's using an illegal substance, regardless of what age, should the punishment be less for marijuana than alcohol? Or should they be the same? <coughs> As a member of law enforcement. Let me go even further, because I'm prepared to add into this sure. bill that the use of alcohol under the same circumstances when it's illegal should have no more than a violation. Is that okay with you? as a law enforcement officer. Well, sir, I'm a jailer. I'm not a law enforcement officer. Well, you represented that you were part of law enforcement. I am part of law enforcement. Okay. That is correct. And um, our intent is to prevent the use of these substances. But the intent of this bill is to set a standard for punishment, in this case, a violation. Mm -hmm. So do you, as a member of law enforcement community, have any problem with making the use of alcohol have the same penalty? But don't we already? No. Then I would suggest as a member of law enforcement that we ought to look at that. So we should make them equal? I think, equal. I think we ought to examine it, sir. So we should put this bill into study until we can get <coughs> whether or not all uses of illegal substances are punished equal. Whatever we do, sir, we should do it objectively and intelligently. That's my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Heffernan. <coughs> so, uh, we'll ask your name, Stephanie Murphy, Carl Hedberg, Mark Ward. Those are the only folks I have signed up. For the record, my name is Chris Heffernan. I'm a lifelong citizen of New Hampshire, current resident of uh, Nashua. Um, I just want to speak briefly about um, some of the myths, uh, specifically the gateway theory. Uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse reported in 1998 that um, there's more of a risk of marijuana users being exposed to harder drugs simply because uh, the only means that they can procure marijuana is through um, a drug dealer who is more often than not um, also selling other drugs. Um, another example is that uh, marijuana typically precedes rather than follows harder drug use. Um, however, by that argument, you could also say that underage cigarette smoking and drinking are also gateway drugs since they both typically precede the use of marijuana amongst young people. Uh, marijuana is the most commonly used illegal drug in this country. So since you have a much higher percentage of people um, trying marijuana as opposed to harder drugs, the data appears to be that um, hard drug users started with marijuana which for the most part is probably true. However, what's not typically noted is that an overwhelming percentage of marijuana users don't try other drugs. According to a 2005 study, over 97 million Americans have tried marijuana. Out of those, 19.7 million used it within the past month. The numbers for past month cocaine users in that same study were around 2.3 million and 136,000 for heroin users. That means there are approximately 17 million marijuana users who have not done other drugs. Same study also draws a correlation between hard drug users and alcohol and tobacco. The rate of hard drug use was eight times higher among teens aged 12 to 17 who had smoked cigarettes in the past month. For heavy drinkers, 59% um, were also heavy drug users as opposed to the 5% who were not drinkers. For teens who both smoked cigarettes and drank alcohol, the percentage of heavy drug users was at 70.9% as opposed to non-smokers and non-drinkers where the percentage was at 3.5%. So if anything is gateway, it's alcohol and tobacco as opposed to marijuana. In conclusion, you can see the argument that we need to be tough on small amounts of marijuana because its usage will lead to harder drugs in the future is not the case. I don't believe anyone here today is suggesting that we legalize marijuana, but the current penalty of jail time, a hefty fine, the potential loss of financial aid, and even the potential loss of employment is excessive. Simply put, the punishment does not fit the crime. So I thank you for allowing me to speak here today. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Do you think the, the, the punishment should be different based on age? In other words, should there be like alcohol? Should there be a different punishment for the use under 21? Personally, I think it should be either 18 or 21 for marijuana usage. I think um, if you don't mind me responding to your um, question posed earlier about alcohol, uh, studies have been shown that alcohol is far more dangerous than marijuana. Thousands of people die a year, so to say that those penalties should be the same, I don't think so. I think the penalties for alcohol should be. You keep them track of the deaths caused by marijuana. There have been no deaths caused by marijuana. None? I'm sorry? None? No. No. There's no lethal dosage of marijuana. Now, maybe a combination with something and else. And I can't get into a band between you, but I happen to know people who have died in motorcycle accidents Drive, so there have been deaths caused, the same as alcohol deaths from driving under the influence. It's not enough. Well, the, the number is far exceeds. I know that for alcohol, also it's suicides, uh, violence, you know, it's, it's not just the substance that kills with alcohol, it's what the substance makes the person do that also kills. So I feel the uh, penalty should certainly be harsher for alcohol, and yes, I think the age, there should be an so age. So we should base our penalties on, on how destructive a substance is. I think that should be one of the factors, yes. I don't think it should be the only factor, but I think it should certainly be one of the factors that's taken into account when discussing these laws. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Sir, um, the, um, co Congress has the ability to change the um, eligibility for higher ed um, loans and so forth. If they were to change that, to um, delete any reference to conviction of marijuana, would you, as, as to, to make you ineligible for aid, would you still support this bill? If, if they were to simply say that- um, If they just cut that out of the law. It's just the financial aid thing? No, because I think, like I, like I stated, the punishment right now with the heavy fine and jail time, I think is excessive. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Deputy Murphy. Do you have a copy of your Sir, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I believe that I requested to speak. My name should be listed under Matt Simon. I signed in right after him. My name is Philip Cohn. Oh, the mind If I forgot to check the box, if it was my oversight, I can. My oversight. Thank you, sir. You're there. Can I speak? Yes. Identify yourself. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Murphy. Uh, I promise you to be brief and also to provide a fresh perspective on this matter that I don't think others have covered before. And I have some written testimony for you as well that's coming around. Um, I'm a medical student. I live in New Hampshire and uh, I've been working towards a medical degree and uh, a PhD in biochemistry as well. And I've done a lot of volunteer work with uh, patients who use medical marijuana, patients who use recreational marijuana, and also substance abusers of other kinds, alcoholics, uh, heroin addicts, and others. Um, so I feel I can offer sort of a unique perspective on this. When you view substance use on a spectrum from the least harmful substances to the most harmful substances, marijuana is just far and away very benign especially compared with other drugs, even legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco. You don't see people come into the emergency room because they have smoked too much marijuana and suffered some toxicity from it. You see people come into the emergency room from heroin overdose, prescription drug overdoses, oxycodone, other drugs of that nature. And I won't read this, this to you because you have a copy of it right in front of you, but there's a chart on my testimony that compares the health effects of marijuana with some other drugs, legal and illegal, under our current statutes. Now, medical professionals use some terms to, to describe the severity of substance use or abuse. And there's sort of a spectrum from, which goes from use to abuse to dependence. A substance user is someone who uses socially or occasionally, and this is the mildest form of substance use. The person can uh, use the substance once in a while, does not have any problem controlling how much or when they use, and doesn't experience bad social, medical, or legal consequences from, or, or work-related consequences from their use. An example would be, you can read the examples right here, but an example would be a person who drinks a glass of red wine every night af after work with uh, his wife at dinner, helps him to relax, he enjoys the way it tastes, and he also drinks two to three beers on a few weekend nights every month while he plays cards with his friends. He's never had a DUI and has never missed work due to having a hangover. And he's never been told by his doctor that he has liver problems or high blood pressure. That would be an example of use or social use. Abuse is the next step on the spectrum where the, the substance use is causing the person some problems in their daily life, uh, be they work-related or uh, with their personal relationships or medical problems. And abuse, an example of abuse would be, Joe drinks four beers every night, he stops at the convenience store on his way home every night to get a cold six pack, and although he tries to wait until he's gotten home, he usually drinks at least one beer in the car. His wife and doctor have both asked him to cut back on his alcohol intake. Usually he cuts back for a few weeks after they confront him, but then he lapses into his usual behavior. Can I interrupt you? And, and I really appreciate what you've done here. Uh -huh. but, um, as you can see, we're going to stop losing people. And, and I just have, as a medical student, you have a conclusion from a medical perspective. Marijuana is relatively a benign substance. Yes. Now, it's been quite some time since I've looked at the medical effects of marijuana, but does it, is it no longer con considered something that causes cancer? That causes cancer? Yeah, there used no. to be a thing. So no, it has no serious health effects whatsoever. No. Um, in fact, many cancer users uh, use marijuana medicinally to calm nausea and to I, I understand the nausea part, but I'm saying the inhalation of marijuana smoke into the lungs causes absolutely positively no problems for the lungs whatsoever. I can tell you about a recent study on that. Uh, if the, you just answer the question, that would really help. Uh, don't yes, the this, is, this is an answer to your question. Okay. Uh, Tobacco users have a 17 times increased risk of lung cancer. Marijuana users have a two times risk of lung cancer if they smoke heavily six so times a week or more. It does have, it does have a possibility of creating cancer. It's a very small one, but especially with, compared with tobacco. Compared to tobacco, but compared to no use, it's, it's, it's twice likely to 
to get cancer if you smoke marijuana than if you smoke pot. If you smoke heavily, many times a week for several years. And I'm not the saying that field, it's In the medical field, is that a benign result? Well, it's benign compared with other drugs. Okay, and especially not, compared not with alcohol and tobacco. You don't use anything. Sure. Thank you. Well, in conclusion, and, I don't yeah, in conclusion. and by the way, thank you for your work. It is very impressive. Okay. Well, you can take a look at this testimony on your own if you wish to. But the the House Committee had several questions for me about the health effects of marijuana. So I'll I'll end here and just tell you that many people people tell their doctors things. They even tell their their medical residents and medical students things, and they tell them they use marijuana. And the vast majority of them are social users. They use very occasionally. It doesn't cause problems in their life. It doesn't cause health medical consequences, especially not the same medical consequences that alcohol and tobacco use cause. And that's the main point I would like you to take home from my testimony. And I'll take any questions if you have them. Thank you. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, for the time. And for the record, my name is Philip Cohn. Um, I quote the Schaefer Commission and um, Jimmy Carter. Mr. Cohn, I'm just going to repeat what I said. I'm going Something to keep it new. Yeah, I'm going to keep it new and truncated. I'm just saying, for further meditation, I'm going to breeze over the quotes in my testimony, but I'd like to leave them also. Um, the founding fathers of this state and of our nation lived during what historians call the Age of Enlightenment. They believed, to put it as simply as possible, that reason was the primary basis for authority. Our ancestors rejected the notion that governments are ruled by divine authority. Instead, they insist that government required the consent of the governed. The New Hampshire Constitution does an outstanding job of articulating this, these principles that characterize such a government. Part 1, Article 18, illustrates one such principle, saying, all penalties ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offense. Unfortunately, the federal government's misguided efforts to eliminate cannabis use has lost all sense of proportionality since Congress passed the Controlled Substance Act in 1970. This act created five schedules of drugs, and President Nixon was pushed to have cannabis labeled as Schedule One, pending the results of the Schaefer Commission, his own commission. Um, yet, much to Nixon's chagrin, in 1972, his commission recommended the decriminalization of marijuana. Of course, Nixon did all he could to bury the report, and his recommendations have never been nationally implemented. The Schaefer Commission's report alludes to the same notion of proportionality that is written to the New Hampshire Constitution. It reads, the criminal law is too harsh a tool to apply to personal possession, even in the effort to discourage use. It implies an overwhelming indictment of the behavior we believe is not appropriate, not the actual potential harm of use of the drug. It's not a great enough justification, it's not great enough to justify intrusion by the criminal law into private behavior a step which our society takes only with the greatest reluctance. Several states, beginning with Oregon in 1973, chose to decriminalize and relax their penalties for marijuana possession. With the federal war on marijuana, perhaps this is the best the state can do for its citizens. At the federal level, President Carter pushed for decriminalization in 1977, but his proportional argument was rebuffed. Here's what President Carter said in his August 2nd, 1977 statement to Congress. Penalties Sir, against... We have I, I appreciate that, especially in the citizen legislation. Okay. If you could just hit some high points. Let me go on to my conclusion. Unfortunately for Carter and for the rest of us, political winds of change were blowing in another direction. And Democrats gave up on this issue when Reagan was elected in 1980. Since Carter failed in his attempt to correct Nixon's error, the war on marijuana has been further escalated by Presidents Reagan, Bush, Clinton, and Bush. And now look at the mess we're in. We have a law in the books in New Hampshire that says over 10% of our citizens are engaged in a criminal lifestyle, regardless of whether or not their marijuana use harms or endangers others. By contrast, the state itself sells alcohol in stores which line the sides of our roads. I hope you will agree that individuals who use marijuana responsibly and privately would be more accurately labeled as violators, not criminals by the New Hampshire Code. It's time that we stop giving these people criminal records and putting them through the system when doing so shows no, no benefit whatsoever to society. This is a bill which truly ought to pass. Thank you. 
question. Yes, sir. Do you believe that, or would you be okay if this bill was amended to state that that violation would be for anyone 21 and over so that it matches the use of alcohol? And I think that it would be a great step forward if we amended our marijuana and other drug laws to match at the very beginning and at the very least our alcohol laws, which are much more sensible than our other laws regarding controlled substances. Thank you. Sir, we, we uh, considered a piece of legislation last year, and we also considered it, considering it presently, that says that a person who has consumption of alcohol, which is considered to be two-tenths of a percent or less, will be guilty of a violation, be fined $300 on the first offense, and $600 on the second offense. And that's what Senator Clay has been talking to everybody about. Mm -hmm. And it's a concern to us that we're treating one thing one way and we're treating something else in a very different way. Yes. So I think he's asking you, and I'm asking you, should they be treated the same way? I think it's a lot more sensible than what we've got right now. So I would say yes, it's a start. For me, it's not the perfect solution. It's not what I'd like to see at the end. But I think that it's a great starting point for incrementalization. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, Mr. Hedberg. I do have kind of a, a different perspective. I'm a, uh, my name is Carl Hedberg. I'm a writer and editor uh, for Babson College and other colleges on, that specialize in entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurs, when we get together at roundtables, we talk about taking the 20,000 foot view of, of an issue. And that's what I'd like to talk about, to, to kind of put it in perspective with where we're headed as a society. Um, the science fiction writer Ray Bradbury actually envisioned a time like this in his 1953 book, Fahrenheit 451. A top-down, overbearing government bent on demonizing the simple possession and enjoyment of books. And here we are in this parallel world with leaders and enforcers guided by tax-funded propaganda that tells us things like cannabis is a toxic, personally destructive, mentally addictive substance that is a gateway to far worse behavior. And the marijuana users are just a, don't worry about them, they're just a deviant subset to our culture, a danger to themselves, and a threat to the society, and especially our children. I don't understand that, our children. I mean, Chief, Chief Craig was here saying that this sends a wrong message to the children. You know, how much longer are we gonna give the, a free pass to prohibitionists who, who claim that marijuana drug reform sends a bad message to our children. As a parent and mentor, I would remind the governor, the AG, and all those like-minded supporters, you know, supporters that raising children is most definitely not the job of government. Government's job, like we, we're doing now, is to discuss and craft law that works for adults and taxpayers. Besides, marijuana is but one of many temptations our children will face along the way, temptations that absolutely warrant their rejection and at the very least at the very least until they physically mature. At that point, we tell our kids, they'll be free to make reasoned decisions about what they can, can and cannot put in their body. But that's not true. As adults in New Hampshire, my daughters will be free to poison themselves with alcohol. They'll be free to addict themselves hopelessly to tobacco. But if they decide to use cannabis tincture for PMS pain, the way that Queen Victoria did, they risk losing their freedoms. The thing is our collective perception of cannabis, and I, I've heard so much of it here, it's, it's become so twisted that when we hear of marijuana use in connection with full and interesting lives like Carl Sagan, the scientist, <coughs> actor Woody Harrelson, or the billionaire entrepreneur Richard Branson, we, we hold those people up as outliers as if by some virtue of superior intellect or creative drive they've managed to rise above the self-destructive behavior that we're promised is, is, is down the road for most marijuana smokers or users. Most Americans take this garbage on faith as well as the official notion that we're finally winning the 75-year-old war against our own citizens. The drug warriors assure us that they're optimistic that we can win this war and that not counting the creative arts, the marijuana use and users has been contained to the Northeast and the West. 
When prohibitionists do acknowledge mainstream marijuana use, they point to the usual suspects, college students, aging hippies, eccentric artists, and the like. The facts on the ground in this war reveal a, a much different reality. Responsible marijuana use and users can be found in every community and demographic across America, and that includes some of the best and brightest among us in New Hampshire. Caregivers, medical practitioners, clergy, teachers, entrepreneurs, law enforcement, and lawmakers. Just as in Bradbury's grim tale, our misguided and highly destructive laws have created a vast and growing underground that holds certain truths and the right to use cannabis to be self-evident. Proof of this can be found on the internet. I put a handout with some of those, um, those um, resources. And there are a couple also of enlightening films. I would, uh, documentaries, you can get them on Netflix. Just watch them. It's, um, you know, and I, I would leave you with the idea that if responsible marijuana use is so deeply ingrained in our culture, and by all indications it is, you can easily find that, that proof out, then it follows that if millions of upstanding Americans can regularly use cannabis, completely undetected by their neighbors, their friends, and their colleagues, then the greatest risk they face is not from the plant, but from the top-down draconian laws that have no place in a free country. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Our last speaker, Mark Warden. Good afternoon, Committee. My name is Mark Warden. I'm a taxpayer in Manchester, and I've cut my testimony by two-thirds, so it's not to be redundant. By the way, I do not smoke pot. I have no interest in it. If it's decriminalized tomorrow, I will not start. But I am concerned as a taxpayer about the costs involved in prosecuting, arresting, and jailing um, sort of victimless crimes such as this. It's my opinion that otherwise law-abiding citizens who use marijuana responsibly are not part of the crime problem, and we must stop treating them like criminals. In 2006, the last year for which data is available, Law enforcement arrested over 829,000 persons for marijuana violations, the highest annual total ever recorded. Of those arrested, approximately 90% were charged with minor marijuana possession only. Seldom emphasized penalties associated with minor marijuana arrests include probation and mandatory drug testing, loss of employment, loss of child custody, removal from subsidized housing, asset forfeiture, loss of voting privileges, loss of adoption rights, and loss of certain federal welfare benefits. Thousands of Americans suffer such sanctions every day. Um, finally, I urge you to support this HB 1623. I believe it's a common sense approach that will refocus law enforcement resources on fighting violent and more serious crimes. Okay. I do have some testimony I will leave. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, as a taxpayer in uh, chasing down violent crime, have you ever seen the results of gang warfare over the disposition of short battles over the, over the selling of marijuana? Yes, uh, we're hearing about that all the time. There's a strong argument to be made that the cause for the turf wars and the rise of gangs, because of the very laws that are against us, that being prohibition. When prohibition of alcohol kicked in in the 1920s, it caused the mafia to become uh, more prominent, to arm themselves, to have shoot out wars with the cops. So often prohibition has the unintended consequence of adding the profit motive to debt gang and dealers, thus making them uh, more, more apt and more willing to get into gun battles to protect their turf. You don't see uh, gun battles going on for people selling Oxycontin and Aspirin or even alcohol. Well, you do for to come. Before we close, I just want to thank the staff today for hanging in here and a very long day. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, okay. without further ado, we'll close the hearing on Hospital 1623. All the information, including hopefully some videos pretty soon, will be up Don't. at nhcommonsense.org along with results of some kind, because we do not know what's going to happen next or when it's going to happen.
Right. So the next step is the right. subcommittee well, will well, report to the entire Senate. If you do, if you do that, 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 that is an entire Senate committee, a Senate Judiciary and Committee, and they will have an executive session and at it's, some point it is a good this week, next week. I don't Except know, I don't really agree that you should be able what, to find what what that that will happen with HB 1623. Make a recommendation for the So if someone wants to get involved, let their voice be heard on this. Where can they go for information on how to contact their senators? That would be NHCommonSense.org. As always, thanks so much, Matt.